The purpose of today's class is we're really going to start looking back, looking to feedback control. So over the last few weeks, we've been looking at process controls, we've been looking at market control systems too. But we really haven't seen how that all fits together, and that's where we're going with today's class. So if you're, if you're looking for this section, of the And chapter seven is about the balance of the view of the board there. And chapter eight as well. So as you as you notice, as, and I mentioned this uh, several classes ago, I have great respect for my students in that I know that you guys can read the textbook. And so my classes are never be standing up at the front and simply reading what's in the textbook. That would be a waste of the $15 an hour you pay to be here in the class. So my goal is to look more at some of the characteristics around this in the material, given context, and give it some interpretation. So let's take a look at this problem. We're trying to control a system, and we gave several examples in the beginning of this course. One is controlling temperature in a room. Another example that I'll commonly refer to is that of driving a car. Okay. So both are common everyday contexts that we're, we're comfortable with. And so those will be my baseline examples that I'll refer to. Now, let's take a look at a little bit of the notation that we've developed so far. We have our process. Okay. And you may have seen that I'm starting to refer to this process by its transfer function, GP on X. So that's the process that we've been considering. We develop process models for, um, for that using ODEs, and then the ODEs have been converted to the last one. And we've said that these processes have inputs, and they have outputs. And I'm just drawing one input, one output for now. So we, we're comfortable with that. But we've also introduced a new, new terminology early on. We call this the manipulated variable. And we call this output my control variable. So those are two terms we've developed for the input and output perspective. The manipulated variable, because that's going to be changed or manipulated in some way. And then the output variable for the control variable. And on that output, we require a sensor to measure its value. That sensor value gets fed into the control system. In the control system, we've got an important aspect over there, and that's the set point. So I'm going to draw the set point over here. The set point on my objective is a value or a number that says, where would you like the output to be? That's your, almost like you can see that as your desired value for your set point, uh, for your control variable. So set point's my desired value from the control variable. And what we're going to do then is, let's start to introduce some terminology here and, and a representation that we're going to use regularly. We're going to take that set point and we're going to compare it to the sensor value. So we're going to subtract, in fact, from the set point what we're measuring in the process through our sensor. This is a little bit different to the diagram we drew at the beginning of the course. In the beginning of the course, I showed you this box called the controller, and I had two lines going into it. The sensor value and the set point value, but I never told you what's going on inside that controller. Here you're starting to get the first hint of what's happening in there. We're going to compare our set point to the control variable's value. And we're going to subtract that. And I said we're going to compare it, so that's what I'm referring to as that subtraction. And that value we're going to call on this video, and the intuitive name for it is the error. That error or that deviation, you might want to call it, that's what we send into this controller. For our 
representation for the next few weeks, we're going to have, in fact, as the input to the controller, will be simply the error. Near the end of the course, we'll look at some other methods where the controller accepts the set point and the sensor value directly into the controller. The controller has two inputs, and then it does some different calculations. For now, though, it's good enough that we simply subtract the sensor reading from the set point and you see the difference, in other words, the deviation to the controller. The controller is going to use that in some way. That's our focus of today's class. We're going to, and in fact, the next few weeks. We're going to look at that controller, what's going on inside here, and how we tell the controller to, to decide what signal to send out here as the output. So this is going to go to a valve, and that valve will then be manipulated to adjust my process. Okay, so this signal, in fact, leaving the controller here is my MD, my manipulated variable. The controller takes the error and returns a manipulated variable. That manipulated variable is a little bit more to it. We're going to leave out a bit of the complexity, but the manipulated variable is a signal that tells the valve how much to open, and then that valve opening is the true manipulated variable on the process. So this might be a flow rate over here that flow rates the actual manipulated variable. For now, though, it's good enough to simply consider the fact that the controller will tell what that new flow rate is, and we'll call that MD. So, um, so what I'm going at, there's a little bit more complexity there. We'll, uh, we'll come and examine that in a bit more detail later on. But for now, it's good enough to see the controller as manipulating our process. Okay, so let's, let's quickly recap the terminology. Manipulated variable is what we're changing. That's my input to my process. The output for my process is the control variable. Control variable goes in and is measured by the sensor and compares it to the set point. That error, that deviation, is then what gets sent to the controller. So we've got here an input to my process and an output to my process. We can look at the same thing on the controller. The controller has an input, it has an error, and the controller has an output, the manipulated variable. So it's no surprise then that we actually can form a transfer function for the controller as well. GC. Because no difference to any of the other blocks here, it has an input, the deviation, error, and it has an output the manipulated variable. Okay, so our goal of today's class then is to understand a bit of this mechanism that goes on inside there. So let's let's just before we get to some examples and understand what the controller is doing. Allow me to just redraw that diagram in the standard form that you're going to become very, very comfortable with over the next few classes. So we call this our block diagram. And where should we start? Well, maybe a good place to start is right where we started here, the process. Let's draw the process and we'll call that GP. What is the input to the process? Have a shake. Okay. MB comes in here. And we'll indicate S to emphasize that this is the variable, the manipulated variable in the Laplace domain. So whatever that variable is doing in the Laplace domain is coming in. The output from GP. is CB. Some of the complexity on the real system for now. 
and simply assume that what we measure here on our process is the value that we feed back. And we feed back this controlled variable measurement. And our standard notation is to say, here's my set point, SP. And emphasize that this is in the Laplace domain. And let's do that comparison over there in one of these circles with the diagonal lines. We're going to take that set point and we're going to subtract from it the control variable. So set point comes in, we subtract from it that control variable, and what leaves here then is the error. So it's plus us. That's absolutely right. We're, in this course, we'll always take our set point to be positive and we'll subtract from it the controlled variables. There are other textbooks who switch the convention around. So this is really important. One day when you're working, you might be using a control system from GE, you might be using a control system from a different vendor. They have different conventions. Some will say set point minus control variable, others will use control variable minus set point. As long as you're consistent, your system will work. But be aware and read the documentation for the system always. So, but most textbooks and most control theory uh, websites that you read will use set point minus control variable. This then goes into this new block, which we call GC. So there's my feedback control in block diagram form. We're going to learn to use this a lot. And actually in the previous tutorial I had you use this block diagram and you calculated the transfer function from this block diagram. So let's just quickly repeat some of that. So my control variable C D is then equal to GP. Minus the variable. So this signal here, CV, is in fact the same as this CV over here. So when this splits, I emphasize this in the tutorial, that split there simply says take whatever the signal is and just copy it. It's not, it's not like a mass flow that gets split in some way same value, simply just getting transferred around. So that control variable value is equal to GP times the manipulated variable. Well, if we work back, and then this confused the people as uh, the last time, well, the manipulated variable is equal to GC times the error. And the error signal we can write as the set point minus the control variable. So we work backwards on the diagram from our outputs. We work back to the error set point over here, and then we loop backwards back to where we started. And then some people were saying, well, you just keep cycling around. Well, let's take a look at what we do. Our goal with this derivation is to find a single transfer function for the entire system so that we can say what is the effect of changing the set point as my input on this output CV. So I want to build one transfer function for everything so that I can write it as CV of S over SP of this. In other words, what is my controlled variable going to do when I make a change in my set point? So if we think of this as, um, as controlling the temperature in the room, controlled variable might be the temperature that we're experiencing here in the room, and set point is the dial that we change if we had it over here, there's the box on the wall. If I change the set point to say from 25 degrees to 22 degrees, 
how is this temperature, the controlled variable, going to change when I make that change in the signal? So we want an understanding of how a process is going to react when we make a signal change. So if we continue this derivation then, we've got, we need to solve CV in the numerator and SP in the denominator. So we can sub this into here, we can sub that into there, and rearrange a bit. So if we do that, we can write it as CV of S is equal to GP of S times MV, but MV itself is equal to GC of S times the error V, but the error is equal to the set point of S minus the control curve. Or we can write it as the control variable of S is 1 plus GP times GC. And on the right hand side, we can extract the set point as GP of S, GC of S times the S, SP of S. It's a little bit messy with all the S's, so I'm just going to keep them there for now. Later on, we'll mark them to make it a little bit easier in the notation. But if you already want to drop them, essentially what I said to CV is 1 plus GP, GC, plus GP, GC, times SP. We're, we're going to be comfortable with dropping the S's in a minute. I won't just yet, so. Let's just not do that right away. And then we can end up with what we want it to be. CV, my output, of the SP, my input. And we'll see this form occurring very commonly. Over here on the numerator, I, I have GP of S, GC of S. And in the denominator, I have 1 plus GP of S. Everyone comfortable with that little bit of algebra? Okay, so that's straightforward, and I'll teach you a trick or two later on on how to write that transfer function up without going through all the algebra. One of the ways you can see that, one of the things to do that is notice that the numerator is simply the product of all the transfer functions in the line that connects the CV to the SP. So the numerator it will always be a simple product of all the transfer functions in sequence between this input SP and an output CV. Okay, so that will simplify writing from this out in the future. And this is the last part. About the product of all the transfer functions. Yeah, don't worry about it just yet. I will, we'll, we'll come back to that later on. Okay, so let's take a look at what we've got here though. We have a representation that tells me what that control variable output is going to do if I make a change in the set point. We said last class that what happens in many processes is we make set point changes frequently. So if we look, think about distillation column for example, we might make a change to the set point for an important variable on the distillation column. For example, the purity, leaving in the distillate stream on the top of the column. We might decide to go from 98% purity to 99% purity. So we make a one unit step change in the set point in that purity. And we do that for whatever reason. It might be because we're changing from producing a grade of distillate that's 98% to 99% purity. And we want that distillation column to move and get to that new purity level. So that's my set point change. CV then will be the actual purity from the column. So this transfer function tells me how I'm going to achieve that goal. And we notice that it's a 
function of the process, GP, and a function of the controller, GC. Now, the process transfer function we've dealt with for four, four weeks. We're extremely comfortable with the process transfer function. GC, though, is our focus on today's class. So let's take a look at what GC could be doing over here. So GC, let's think of some ways that you can control the process. If you were wanting to change a process, what strategy might you use? What strategies do you use? Think of riding a bike, think of controlling a, the temperature in the oven, or the temperature in your fridge at home. These are all control systems you've experienced. Or when you're riding a bike, you're actually the control system yourself. How do you deal with making changes to the set point? So if you're riding a bike, the analogy would be you want to go from riding at, say, 10 kilometers an hour to 15 kilometers an hour. What sort of strategy do you use as a control system? Always go faster. Suddenly get faster or slowly? So gradually increase your speed to achieve your goal. What's going on in your mind when you've done that? So you've made the decision you want to go faster, what happens next? You decide what you have to change, and then you just do it, okay? Let's talk maybe about controlling the temperature in the room. If we have a furnace that's in the, in the building here somewhere, and we decide we want this room 5 degrees warmer, what do we do? Change the set point to be five degrees warmer. Then what happens next? Furnace kicks in, and then we approach that temperature where we want to be. And then what happens? Okay. So if it's within tolerance, then it shuts off. Okay, so if the error is with intolerance, shut off the furnace. So how would you write that mathematically? Right? This is what we're asking here. That's our goal of the next few classes, is to figure out what's going on in here. some nominal fuel flow rate. Okay. So as long as the temperature of the fuel here, the CV, is equal to or very close to the set point, then your error is zero. So it says, don't touch your fuel duct. Yeah, makes sense. So as long as your process is doing what it's supposed to be doing, this error is small, the output here is don't make a change. Just keep going what you're doing. So we can see this then in deviation form. I'm going to start drawing these with MB dash and CB dash. So if you, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, your error is small, then don't make a change to your process. Let's consider the following. Your process says your temperature needs to be 25 degrees. You measure 20 degrees. 
So what is your error here? Sure. Twenty-five. Minus five. Okay. Or, or plus five. Plus five. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my name. So 25 minus 20, our error is 5 degrees. Consider that as your first case. Now consider this next case. Set point is 25. Output is 10. What's the error? 25 to 15. What do you expect to happen over here for those two cases? What do you expect for a furnace the output to be for the first case? Okay, so if you were the control system, you would open this valve a smaller amount for the first case. For the second case, you'd open the valve by a larger amount. What have you done over there? Mathematically. If you had to write an algorithm to tell what MV is, given the error E, what would that algorithm be doing that we just described? Multiply it by the error. Multiply what by the error? You're saying if you have 15, then if you multiply that by a function, then your change is going to be larger than 55. Okay, so multiply it by some number or some percentage. So the simplest algorithm, and actually you can argue probably one of the most intuitive algorithms that you, you do without even realizing you're doing it, is you're making a change in proportion to your error. So the larger the error, the larger the action you take. If this deviation over here is small, or even zero, then you take little to no action. If this error is really large, you have to take a lot more action. Think of the following case. If we switch to the other analogy we're going to use, a man of driving. You're driving at 60 kilometers an hour, and your foot is on the gas pedal at that angle. You want to go to 100 kilometers an hour. So that's an increase of 40 kilometers an hour. Let's say that that pedal is such that every one degree change in the pedal increases the car speed by one kilometer an hour. So if you're at 60 and you want to go to 100, you push down the gas by an extra 40 degrees to get there. If you're at 60 and you only want to go to 80, you only make a change of 20 degrees. So you increase the speed by change in the gas pedal by 20 degrees. So you make a change in proportion to the amount of error. But let's think of this next, because this system doesn't just work once. This loop keeps going round and round. So let's take that gas analogy one step further. You're going at 60, you want to go at 100 kilometers an hour, you depress the gas pedal by 40 degrees so that you get to 100 kilometers an hour. Now you start going faster and faster, What's happening to that error? So you drop, you push the gas pedal in more, more fuel to the car, the car's accelerating. Error is approaching zero. So you take your foot back a little bit, right? So our error drops off, you don't you back away. Okay? As you get to where you want to be, your error then is zero. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at quantifying that in some way, mathematically. So you've got this idea now in your head. Um, let's look at what we are talking about in a mathematical way. And the easiest way is to visualize the relationship here between my controller and my error. And the way we do this, or we can draw this quite simply, is to say that is error in the time domain. And actually, 
sheet, and she works fairly symmetrically. Because errors can be just can be positive as well as negative. So that the simplest control system that you can have says make a manipulated variable over here. So emphasize that these are function of time. Make it equal to look something like that. Which says that if your error is zero, your output is some manipulated variable steady state value. So this is, for example, the angle with which you hold your gas, your foot on the gas pedal, to keep the car going in steady state. It's not zero, right? The gas pedal angle isn't, isn't nothing because you still have to apply some gas to simply go at steady state. Furnace analogy is the furnace has to be on supplying some fuel to heat the oil. So there's always a non-zero manipulated variable. That's simply the baseline, which is the amount of action you take on the manipulated variable when the error is zero. So you're always providing some input into your process at steady state. This blue line then indicates what that action is when the error is non-zero. So when the error starts to move negative, you apply less input to your process. When your error is exceeds zero, you apply more input into your process. Okay. So we call this a proportional controller. And the slope of that line we call KC, K subscript C. And if we want to represent this mathematically, we could write a formula that relates the manipulated variable in time to the error in time. line or the steady state manipulated variable. Okay, so just uh, we can maybe write that a little bit mathematically. If E of t is equal to zero, in other words, no error, then mv is simply the steady state value. Now let me write it a little bit differently and you'll start to see why I'm heading this way. Is let's create deviation variables. So deviation variables, remember, are the variables subtracted from its steady state. So in deviation form. write mv dash as a function of time is equal to mv minus mvs. So, so we're creating a deviation form for the manipulated variable. And then if we take that over on the, to the left hand side, we've got this mvs term taken over to the left, we can write then that mv dash Kc times error. So let's perhaps understand this control system in the context of 
very straightforward example. An example let's use is we've got two flows, a hot flow and a cold flow. And this is going into a mixing tank. And the outlet over here is the temperature that we're concerned with. Okay, so this, I mean, one, when, one way you can see the system, this is simply the tap in your washer. You've got a cold water flow and a hot water flow, and you're adjusting this to do, uh, let's say you're washing dishes, you don't want to burn your hands, so this temperature over here is the temperature that's the blended temperature. So this mixing tank is in fact simply just the tap itself. There's no actual mixer in there. But that hot water stream, FH, that flow is what you're going to adjust in order to meet the temperature requirements. So if you wanted to draw this as a control system, let's just take this back here, but that temperature is going to go into a control system and you've got a set point and you, the set point needs to make a change to the valve. So let's maybe work backwards here. There's my valve. And that signal that I have to send to the valve comes from my control system. So that's going to be my manipulated variable. My manipulated variable is FH. Well, the control system needs to accept the error. Where does that error come from? Well, we take that temperature sensor up here, and we've got to compare it to our set point. And then that error is what I feed into the process, into the controller. Okay, so I'll just re rework the diagram a little bit to represent it in the, in the form that we've just learned. Now, if this was you washing your hands, the set point is in your mind, and you're the controller as well. So all of that is the same is in your head. And you're going to then adjust your flow FH manually by hand. That's your manipulated variable. But in a real process, you have to convert what you're doing so you want to make a robot version of yourself, then this is what you have to be looking at. Right? So there's a controller receiving the error, and that's going to adjust the flow. So how is, how is this going to work? Well, we need a transfer function of the process, and we need a transfer function for the controller. So let's take a look at, at those two quickly, and then we can tie this all together. for the process, think about this carefully. What is the manipulated variable and what is the controlled variable? Control variable is the temperature of the water. So control variable is the temperature. And the manipulated variable the flow rate of the hot water. Flow rate of the hot water. So notice that this is in the format control variable over manipulated variable. Okay, and that's my GP of S, my process transfer function. The GP of S is the transfer function that tells how your output, your controlled variable, is going to react to a change in the manipulated variable, FH in this case.
And for this example, let's use that GP of S. Let's just do this symbolically. There's going to be a gain, KP, and a time constant tau P, S plus 1. So we're saying this is a first order process. If I open that valve, FH, I'm going to see a first order response in the time domain in the temperature. I'm just going to use symbolic representation for that, for this example. Is the gain, just out of interest, is the gain positive or negative? Positive or negative? <coughs> positive. Is tau P positive or negative? <coughs> positive. N is positive in this case because if I increase the flow, FH, that temperature will rise. So let's take a look at putting this together then, as I said. One way we'll do this is by using a block diagram. So let's, uh, let's draw the block diagram now for the process and we'll fill in the information we know. So block diagram, we begin with the set point. We're going to compare that then to create an error, E of T. Sorry, E of S, I should say. We're always going to work in DVA in the class variables here. E of S. GC is my control system, and the output here is the manipulated variables. GC here, for the simplest control system, remember we said we drew it there like that. Let's just go back to that drawing I had a minute ago. I said MV and M. So my manipulated variable is going to be related to my error. And this point here was MV. Yes. Let me quickly show you one thing I forgot to do on that side before I erase the diagram. Remember we created deviation variables. Right? We said MV minus MVS is equal to MV dash. What has that done over here on my graph is MV minus MVS. What does that do? Exactly. It simply takes this curve and shifts it there to zero. This is now my error, and that's MV dash. So by creating deviation variable, all you do is you shift your y-axis, frame of reference, and now you're passing through the origin. Okay. So let me perhaps draw the original diagram up here for you. I erased it a little bit too early to explain the fact that here was an error, and this was MV. And the line I drew was a line that had slope KC and it had intercept equal to NV subscript S. <coughs> Going from this curve that you see here on the whiteboard to the curve that's on the blackboard, we're simply changing my y axis to be the deviation form of NV. So NV dash is equal to NV minus NV S. Okay, so all that happens is that y axis, this baseline shifts up to here. Okay. Everyone clear on that? So it simply says then that MV dash related to E. Notice what that is. This slope was equal to KC. So MV dash over E Um, so you're, when you have the deviation variables, you're all going to be in the origin. Okay. Uh, just this relationship for the control. Yeah. 
So what this essentially does is it's a graphical way to show what the transfer function is. MV dash is my output from the control system. E is the input to the control system. So when I want that here in the transfer function, MV dash over E is a constant slope. We can write that as k And then the next step is to add in the process and then close the loop. GP is, goes over there, my process transfer function, and we're going to write that as KP tau PS plus 1. And the output from that is my temperature or controlled variable in this case. So this output is CB dash of S. And what we do next is what we call closing the loop. You bring that controlled variable, that measurement of the temperature, you bring it back and close your loop. So, before I move on, let me just quickly make sure that you've got everything understood. Any questions at this moment? Very clear that what's moving around this transfer function block diagram is the error coming into your control system. That error is going to get multiplied by a single number. KC, that manipulated variable is the deviation variable of the manipulated variable. That's going to go into your process and you're going to get the output control variable in deviation. Okay, so what I'll do next class, I'm going to show you this diagram in the time domain and then I'm going to repeat this diagram in deviation form so you can see the two relationships side by side. It's very important to appreciate that block diagrams, we're going to draw them in deviation form. But remember, we still have to live in the real world where we don't have deviation variables. Right? So we're going to add back our steady state. But before we wrap up today's class, absolutely any questions. This needs to be clear before Wednesday. Yes, Mark. Um, that's just arbitrary. For well, this case, it's I'm just choosing that the relationship between the flow FH and the temperature T is first order. For many processes, this is that's a good good first start. The air. We're going, okay, so that's a good question. Is the, is this curve always linear? We're going to look at and understand what this linear curve means next class. We're going to see there's an important shortcoming and then what we're going to change to improve.